You guys have been asking for it for a bit, and I told you on my Instagram, instagram.com slash ethnosynology, that I would do a video on books about anthropology, prehistory, and dogs that I often use and cite frequently, okay? I don't have a teleprompter, I'm just gonna riff, so whatever. Let's talk guns, germs, and steel really quick. The Demon Haunted the World by Carl Sagan. The mantra of the book is that science is a candle in the darkness. And hold on, so let's, uh, science is a candle in the darkness. Nailed it. What this book teaches you is that science has a lot of answers to things, and people that don't understand things might just curse the dark, as in, like, they're scared of it, they don't understand it, so therefore they stuff it away. We don't want to talk about it. Or you solve it with problems that don't necessarily fix it. Well, Carl Sagan, in his book, he posits that just understanding science and researching things helps you understand it better, and therefore it makes you less fearful of the world unless you just get a more holistic view of how the universe works. And I'm not gonna say it got me through some tough times, because, I mean, a lot of books do, but it just made me re-solidify the way that I view the world, and I think that's a really cool thing, and you should really check it out. It's by Carl Sagan, and Carl Sagan's just brilliant in general. This one is called The Human Past, and it's one of just, it's just a great overview of human prehistory. You can divide archaeology into historical archaeology and prehistoric archaeology. That's, there's more to it than that, but those are just two if you wanted to have a yin and a yang to it. There's that, uh, or just a 50-50 split to make it easy. And this covers all of prehistory. So from early hominins, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, how we first made tools, all the way through to agriculture and the origins of state. That's The Human Past by Chris Scar. An edited volume, it's a textbook. Do not cite the textbook directly. What you do is you find the citation in source, or you go into the back and you find the references in which actually said that material. The textbook's just a compilation. A lot of people get that confused. If you put a textbook in the bibliography, you're not wrong, but you actually have to cite the direct person who said that, and it's in the edited volume of this. You can also, and I don't have this book with me, I have a PDF of it, is Archaeology by Robert Kelly and David Hurst Thomas, and I'll put that right here. That one is a fantastic textbook as well. I just didn't use that in undergrad. I've read this one cover to cover. Uh, that one I've read and referenced through, also fantastic. I would totally recommend that, not because he was my professor, just because it's actually a solid book. I also worked with DHT at one point too. If you're watching this, sorry. I'm gonna skip back and forth between dog books and archaeology books and anthropology books because I don't know what exactly you're here to look for, so I'm just gonna intercut it and that way you have to watch the whole video. Uh, if you want a general overview of the psychology of domestic dogs and how that psychology may have played into how dogs came to be, as in the transition from wild wolves into dogs, The Social Dog, Behavior and Cognition by Julianne Kaminsky and Marshall Pashini. Nope. Julianne Kaminsky and Sarah Marshall Pischini. Pischini, Pischini, Pischini. Sounds, sounds like fish. This book has a lot of stuff. It talks about different psychological experiments with dogs and how that reflects in their evolution. Uh, how dogs actually interact versus how they interact with wolves. I reference this book quite a bit if I'm referencing dog behavior, especially in reference to prehistoric dogs, but it has tons of stuff about modern dogs in it. Another book by Robert Kelly. It is called The Lifeways of Hunter-Gatherers, The Foraging Spectrum. For 90% of human history, we were foragers. We didn't grow food, we didn't have states. We just lived in small bands of 30 to 50 people, roamed and were nomadic and foraged for our food and hunted, fished, and collected. This explains how people lived that way in terms of group size, how they exchanged land with each other, how they traded with each other, warfare, how men and women differentiated their labor. And it's just backed up by data after data after data and has graphs. Look at this graph! And all sorts of things. Dude, it, it's fantastic. We had to read this for a hunter-gatherers class in graduate school. Actually, an undergraduate. It was a graduate level class, not a big deal. You had to read this book. If you're gonna study hunter-gatherers or you wanna study how people lived in the past, this is the book you want. Inside of a Dog by Alexandra Horowitz. Alexandra Horowitz is a, a dog researcher. She's on the New York Times bestselling list like quite often. I think her books are brilliant. And what I found super interesting about this was I was hearing a, a snippet from it on NPR and she talked about how she really wanted to understand what her dog was sniffing. So she got on her hands and knees and sniffed with the dog. Maybe not on her hands and knees, but she like she bent down and got really low in the middle of Manhattan, sniffing what her dog was sniffing. Could have been urine, could have been feces, could have been something dead, right? But she was sniffing what her dog was sniffing and wanted to get eye level and get you know into the mind of a dog. And that's why this book is called Inside of a Dog. She wants to understand how they think, why they behave that way, and it's backed up with science and research. 
very interesting. And if you want a non-dense academic book, this is fantastic. And she does put her citations in the end and it's not like some Jared Diamond thing. Lithics. If you want to understand how stone tools work, how people made stone tools, the physics of how stone tools are made, the different cultures of stone tools by Neanderthals and humans, Homo erectus, you want to read Lithics by William Andrewski. He was at Washington State University in Pullman. Anybody that understands or learns about stone tools in college usually has to read this book. The Wild Canids, their systematics, behavioral ecology, and evolution. This book is just a broad overview of the wild canids, or different canids, animals that live in Canidae, and some like animals, and explains their habitat, their size, how they're different from each other. It's a little dated, and it's kind of, in some aspects, it's, it's lacking, but it does give you a really interesting overview of their behavior and the dynamics between different ones. It's backed up with data. A lot of the stuff has to do with like ecology and, and prey dynamics and their range and things like that and their optimality of their foraging. How they operate and it, with the foraging spectrum, it's, it's a scientific and zoologic look at a species. And this is a solid one. I cite this literally twice a week. The Archaeology of Animal Bones by O'Connor. If you're interested in archaeology and you're interested specifically in archaeozoology or zooarchaeology, this explains how we can quantify animal bones at sites, how we can interpret human behavior through animal bones at sites. Essentially, you can look at what they're eating, how they were butchering it, how they were hunting it, all by their bones, really. And it, not all, all of it, but you can tell a lot of it. Just a solid one. This was, it was the recommended text for my zooarchaeology class in graduate school. I've had other ones too. There are other zooarchaeology books. This one is just the one that I used. Dogs and What is a Dog by Lorna and Raymond Coppinger. Uh, I guess I'll throw those text things up here. These books are literally how I understand dog evolution. Now I will say they are dated. There's other theories out there, but these are the first two people that I saw that put a very solid overview of the biology and zoology of how dogs came to be, or at least the leading theories. Other people are gonna argue different things about dogs, foundation for what I know came from these books. You can also look at Darcy Morey. Uh, he wrote a book called Dogs and that is Dogs by Morey. I'm gonna throw that up right here. He's at Radford University, I think he's retired now. That's actually the groundwork for how dogs are studied archeologically, or at least dog domestication in the human past is through Morey's book. First Peoples in a New World by David J. Meltzer. Probably one of the best books in archeology span I've ever read. It's kind of got some dense science in it because it's David Meltzer, but there's also just, it, it's a solid overview of how humans came into the America. And it's kind of mostly talks about Clovis, but it goes into some pre-Clovis and it goes into how the, how the Clovis turns into the archaic. It gives a fair assessment of the debate on the peopling of the Americas. It also goes in depth into their lithic culture, how they lived and how they hunted, uh, the different ways they could have came through the Americas. And if you're not specifically interested in the peopling of the Americas, that's fine. But what's interesting about that is a lot of researchers will say there's no Mesolithic in, in North America. There's no Mesolithic. The Mesolithic is the transition from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic. It's that short time after the Ice Age before people started farming. In the Americas, we didn't really have that. We had the Clovis culture. We had Paleo-Indian period. And there weren't just Clovis and Paleo-Indian period. There was other Paleo-Indian peoples than Clovis. So those people that left Europe and Asia and came over to this way and through Asia or down the coast, whichever one you want to see, not through the Atlantic. I have a book on that. We're not going to talk about that one. It's how a hunter-gatherers in ancient Asia came over to the Americas found a vast new continent full of strange ass creatures and that was just open and had no people inhabiting it before and how they just took over a continent from Alaska all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. And Clovis people are the, I have a bias, I love Clovis. It's just an interesting, interesting, interesting thing in human history and it's dope. Now we have a neat mix of dogs and anthropology and that is The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. You probably, if you didn't know that was by Charles Darwin, we have a problem. If you haven't read this book, you need to read it. Evolution is at the root of all biological science. If you don't understand evolution, then biology, at least to me, doesn't make that much sense. It answers questions for me throughout my day. Another book that I find absolutely fascinating and just like foundational to what I know is A History of Dogs in the Early Americas. Now, if you're not American, you're not interested in North American archeology, span that's fine. 
But if you think about it, the Americas and Australia and a lot of parts of Africa were left untouched by Western civilization for a long time. From, from the Paleolithic up through 1492, these cultures in North America had not had contact with Europe or Western civilization. So we have a lot of really formed myths, we have a lot of really formed cultures, and we have a lot of really formed archeology span around dogs in the Americas. And they were brought to the Americas. It was the only domestic animal they had actually, except for turkeys and guinea pigs eventually, and the llama. <laughs> uh, how dogs were brought by the Spanish, how the Spanish used dogs to uh, intimidate and attack uh, local villages when they came through to look for gold. Uh, just terrible stuff. A lot of just stuff about dog mythology, uh, dog myths in the Americas, uh, dog figurines, like different, just dog art, how dogs work around archaeological sites. Anyway, I'm just gonna go on. This book is amazing, please read it. There needs to be more of these books for the different regions of the world. There's only one in America right now that I know of. Really read that book. Uh, the History of Dogs in the Early Americas, and that is by Marion Schwartz. One other book that you should definitely read if you're an archeologist for sure is uh, Thomas F. King's Cultural Laws and Practice. This explains all of the archeological legislation that allows archeology span to happen in the United States of America. From 46 CFR 36, Hello darkness, my old friend. To the Antiquities Act of 1906, to NAGPRA of 1990. This book tells you all the things you need to know. I have a copy of this in my dig bag, actually, because I have to reference it quite a bit. Uh, I also have one at my desk at work, and I have a third copy here on my bookshelf. Uh, I use this a lot. If you're interested in archeology, span or if you're a collector, or you like to collect things on your land, I don't condone collecting archaeological finds. I don't. It's also illegal on federal and state land. However, if it's your property, you can do what you want. I do find it unethical. You do what you want. If you read this book, it tells you what's legal and what is not legal. Uh, again, if it's on federal land and it's on state land, if it's land that you do not own, you do not touch archaeological sites. It's like touching an endangered species and ruining it. You don't do that. If you take an arrowhead off some, if, even if you just find an arrowhead in a riverbed, if you just find an arrowhead on the surface after you mow the lawn, do not touch it. Take a picture of it, mark the location with your really intense smartphone. You can literally pin down to the meter where that thing is and tell an archeologist. If you take that arrowhead off the ground, you're losing a lot of context that can tell you way more about how those people lived on your property than just taking the arrowhead to show your mom or your dad or your girlfriend, whoever, right? Don't do it. Call an archeologist. They love to talk about it. I do. I would love to come look at your land and tell you more about it. If you remove things from context, we lose the context and we don't know. It's just best to not, just leave it. It was there, it was left by somebody, don't touch it. Archeology span is a bit different how that works. In some places, it, we legally have to pull it out of the ground to do that. Now, if you if you have a house that you're trying to build and you find an archeological site on it and it's your property, you technically don't have to do anything with it. But if you find human remains anywhere, on your property, on someone else's property, on federal or state land, the first thing you should do is call the police. Technically, you're supposed to call the coroner if you know it's not a recent murder, but a lot of people don't know how to tell that if you find a dead body or just bones. You call the police. Do not touch them. Do not do anything with them. If they're Native American, there are a lot of laws and a lot of fines you can get if you touch that or you move them from their context. If it's a recent murder or if it's an archaeological site from 100 years ago, still do not touch it. Do not take pictures of it. You call the police and you call the coroner. The police will connect you to the coroner and will come out to your land with you. Do not touch human skeletal remains. Let's talk guns, germs, and steel really quick. Now, I have this book, I have all of Jared's Diamond books because I enjoy reading them. However, I should know, and now archeologists are gonna quit the video because I just said that. They're interesting books. However, a lot of the stuff that he talks about is wrong. It's not backed up by data, and he doesn't cite a lot of things. You should also know that Jared Diamond is not an archeologist. I believe he's a zoologist that studies birds, so an orithologist, ornithologist, I don't know how you say that. He's bird law, Charlie. Brilliant ideas. A lot of them are not backed up. A lot of them I think might be. It's still a book that everyone needs to read in archeology span because it tells you how to do science communication albeit wrong, it's still a solid book. 
This book, when I had to read it in history class, got me really into archaeology. I don't diss Jared Diamond for that. I got into archaeology because of Jared Diamond, I will say that. However, once I got into archaeology and learned why his book is kind of wrong in a lot of ways, it helps you have a more critical eye of the past and how to look for things better in science. And that harkens back to the demon haunted world, which is right here. The Art of Baloney Detection is, talks about logical fallacies, Occam's Razor, that help you understand science better and how to think more critically. And that's the most important thing. I, you can find all the information you want in these books. You could probably just find it on the internet. But the most important skill you're gonna learn in college and especially in grad school is how to think critically. And that's the most important lesson I want you to take away from today.